Tracy experienced a rock bottom moment when she found herself in the hospital after contemplating suicide. She tells us about that moment and how she picked herself up after decades of being victimized. Now Tracy is a registered nurse and helps people to transform their tragedy and PTSD into profound healing. Join me for Tracy's story. This is the Highway to Healing. Thank you for joining me for today's episode, Tracy. I want to dive right into this. I know that you All right, have let's a, do it. Yeah, I know you have a background that consists of as you described it, decades of trauma and pain. And for our listeners, I know that a lot of them are going through their own trials and tribulations. And my hope is that Mm -hmm. by you sharing your story, that they too can see themselves in an element of it and then realize what it is that they can do to take themselves out of it and get to that really beautiful state of life where they feel joyful and grateful and happy. And Tell our listeners a little bit about your past, those decades of trauma and pain. What do you want to bring up to our listeners? What happened? So much. Um, When I think of, you know, when I speak out, I speak a lot on PTSD and past traumas. Um, And I was blessed. I can now say that I believe I was blessed (laughs) with multiple different kinds of trauma. So I could speak out on platforms such as yours and mine and and really speak out and be able to touch people so I can let them know that I get it. I understand it. And so we can move, like you said, move forward and learn how to grow and heal from there. So, um, and I hate, I hate going into it because like I could list like, a ton. And I don't want to make it sound like, Oh, poor me, because that's not how I feel. Honestly, now I'm to the point where I feel blessed, but, um, I was, I was, I was sexually molested as a child and I didn't remember it until about two, three years ago. Um, it came, it started coming back when I had hit my rock bottom. Um, so I had things like that. I had very abusive relationships that I had to like flee where I was living to a completely different side of the country. And like, my name was on nothing. Um, literally scared for my life. Um, I've been in, uh, like I said, abusive relationships, both physically and mentally and spiritually and sexually. And I've been raped. Um, I was in a major car accident that had me recovering from physical brain injury for quite a while. It took me a long time to kind of recover, but I, I did. Um, multiple miscarriages. Um, I was basically left at the altar, which was just life shattering um, for a while. Um, just multiple, multiple different aspects of trauma. And the problem was at the time, um, I saw myself as kind of this strong woman. I didn't need help. I didn't need anyone. I didn't need any talk therapy. I didn't need to talk to anyone about it. I was fine. I had strong shoulders. I'm fine, right? And so it just kept piling and piling and piling and piling until I finally broke and hit what, like you said, rock bottom. And I wanted to take my life. And I almost did. And so that's kind of the general story of how I got to that point. I appreciate you sharing uh, those instances with us. I I know it's not easy to step into a platform like this always and say, Hey, here's where I've been. Here are some (laughs) of the things I've been through. And so I appreciate your vulnerability and sharing that. As you look back on it, even, do you feel like there was a common theme uh, that, you know, cause some people will hang on to victim energy, right? Like they were victimized mm-hmm. once maybe yep. as a, as a young person, and then they don't Absolutely. heal or release that energy of being the victim. And then they pull that thread through the rest of their life. And then they start bringing all kinds of things to them that reconfirm yes. that they're a victim until they realize mm-hmm. that, Oh, wait, I'm not, I need to heal on this. Mm-hmm. So when you look right. back at this, these 
things, this list of things you've been through, do you find that there is a thread that goes through all of it? Victimhood. Absolutely. Um, Cause I, I did, I would, you know, why I, I believe that, you know, in, in God. And I would just think, why would a true loving God let me go through this? And then why this? And then why this? And then why would he let me go through all of this? Like I was very much meant, uh, victim mentality and um, not vocally necessarily. Um, in fact, most people in my life have no idea most of what I've been through because I wasn't vocally victimizing myself, but in my head, it was just the world was against me. No one loved me. I wasn't good enough. I mean, it was ju- it was it was a very self-inflicted, partially really dark time. And like you said, I think it brought more of that to me because I needed to see it. Um, and it took me a while to see it. it. It really did. But it was when I finally hit rock bottom that I finally was like, uh, this, this isn't working for me, obviously. And I kind of dug into gurus like you um, that really just brought up my vibration that helped me in my healing. Um, I did both medical and holistic ways of trying to get through that healing process because I wanted to take my life my trauma, my, my victimhood into victory. I wanted to make it my story. I wanted to turn my life around. So I was the, the leading star role of it. If you want to call it that be the Cinderella story. <laughs> no, I appreciate that. I, I love your outlook on it, that you've been through all of these things to get you where you're at today. Let's take a moment though and go back to, you've alluded to it a couple of times, your rock bottom moment, or perhaps, you know, what some people would refer to as their dark night of the soul. So walk us through that. What happened? Just one. (laughs) I had quite a few. Um, Like I said, in the beginning, I really didn't, I didn't see all the dark holes until I started working through and my, my counselor or whoever I was talking to would be like, do you realize that in and of itself, people come in for help for just that one thing. Like, and now we have to deal with all of these things. Like (laughs) when you get better, you need to be helping people not do that. Um, I guess my, my deepest moment was when I was, I was ready to end it. And, um, I just, I couldn't do it anymore. And it was to the point, it was sadly enough, I was not self-aware enough. I just kept myself busy, just busy, 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 busy. Um, I had a job that I loved. I have family that loved me. Um, it wasn't that my whole life was this deep, dark pit. I mean, in a lot of ways, I had a very normal, good life um, mixed in with a whole lot of trauma. But I, I don't even, I can't even tell you what the last thing was the last straw on the camel's back but finally I was just like I'm done I cannot do this anymore I'm done and um my my family somehow knew that there was an issue and they needed to come I just lived right across town and they came and they showed up and stopped me in my tracks and got me some help and um it was when I was in the emergency room, um, they held me there for a while just to keep an eye on me and things like that. That that's really when I had to just kind of I was by myself in a dark emergency room by myself. The door was closed. Um, which why did they have a closed door? That's not very smart. But anyway, um, <laughs> I remember just sitting there and I couldn't sleep, but I was exhausted. And I remember thinking, this is your time this is your choice. If you don't change things around, you're going to be right back here or worse. And there's people who love you and depend on you. And, and this is not what you want for your life or for theirs. And so I I said a quick, very intense, uh, sorry, um, prayer and just really prayed for help and strength and the will, because I had none obviously at that point, um, to figure it out. And it it wasn't, a you know, I wasn't great the next day. I mean, it's been a journey from there. Um, but I would say that was the, 
that was the turning point was probably right there in the emergency room. And I've never even talked about that on my platform. I haven't gone that deep. So <laughs> I can so sense there you, you go. Yeah, I can sense you getting emotional um, as you talk about it. And so just to clarify for the people listening, you were in the emergency room after um, contemplating suicide. Would that be correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. I hadn't done anything, but when someone has that kind of plan to, to execute, they, they, you know, they put you on hold for a little bit and watch you and see what they need to do with you next. Right. Absolutely. So I've, I've heard that they do that. I didn't, I didn't know if it was by jurisdiction or state, but um, thank you for that clarification. So you find yourself in the emergency room and that is your dark night of the soul, we'll call it. Then what happens? Because people listening, there are going to be some that have found themselves in that same situation. Perhaps they were thinking about ending it. Um, and maybe today they woke up and they're like, I don't know how much longer I can do this. So speaking to the audience, what did you do next? How did you rise from that dark place? I say this to encourage, it's not going to sound encouraging in the beginning, but it wasn't, uh, you know, I didn't feel great the next day and I wasn't motivated to read and I wasn't motivated to reach out to, for help that it, it wasn't that kind of a turnaround for me. And I don't say that to be discouraging in any way, but if you feel let yourself in that place of okay, I didn't have that moment. I didn't have that flip. I don't think you go from that low to that, to a complete flip overnight. I'm sure there are miracles that happen. I was not one of them. So if you're not one of them either, um, don't, don't take that to heart. There, there's still hope. Um, really, I think the first thing I had to do was I started talk therapy um, and medication um, to kind of help the physical aspect and the, the talking it out. Um, and again, the, the first counselor I went to was horrible. So, and again, I say that because it is so important if you're reaching out for someone to, for talk therapy or professional help, it's important you find someone that you click with, that you feel you're going to be able to work with. And oftentimes it's not always the first person you go to. Sometimes you have to kind of do some searching to find the right source for you. Um, so I don't say that to discourage you. It, it's just part of it, unfortunately. Um, so I, it took me a little bit. And then I found, I finally got in a groove and found some people. Really, my first step was having to come to realization of what had happened in my life and what I really felt because for s decades, I mean, decades, literally, I was just shoving it away. Just, I'm fine. I'm good. Keep plugging. Um, I, I can be pretty goal orientated. Um, I was in nursing school and, you know, I had to go for my next test and then I had a nursing job and it was a very high intense floor and it was just go, 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 go. Um, so I had to really come to grips with what I really needed to work through and coming out of it. This is kind of the analogy I use. If if you're surrounded by a forest and you know everything that you love is on the other side of that forest, ignoring the forest isn't going to make it go away. It actually makes it grow. And you get more branches, you get more foliage, you get more of the stuff growing from underneath, and then it gets even harder. So you have to go through the forest to get to the other side. Um, so you have to go, I feel, through those feelings, but don't stay there. You have to go through how you really felt, give it a voice, whether it be like you mentioned art or talk therapy, there's, there's many ways that we could talk about, um, but whatever it is, you have to give them a voice, kind of work through it. So then you can get to the other side. And then there's a freedom that comes with that, that the light, the, the weight just lifts off your shoulders layer by layer. And, you know, I'm, I'm not done, you know, it's never a journey where you're just done. Um, but it gets less hard. 
but that was the first thing I had to do was really just come to grips with what happened, work through that because I wasn't before for years and years. Um, then I was able to work on, on the healing side of things. I appreciate your honesty because I think telling people that it's just all going to magically sort itself out would be a disservice. And what I heard you also say was, you know, the, one of the first things you have to do is take accountability for everything that has happened in your life and then use that for the fuel to take, you know, through that forest to help uh, the weed whacker, you know, of taking down <laughs> all the weeds and trees and shrubs that have overgrown, you know, on that pathway. Yes. No, I love that analogy. You know, we often talk about things that people can do themselves, you know, what actionable steps they can take to start to move through that forest. And I often talk about meditation and I love salt baths and, you know, there's all Mm -hmm. kinds of things, affirmations and mantras. Is there anything Mm -hmm. that would be an actionable step that you can share with our listeners that might be worth them giving it a try? Honestly, as long as it is a positive thing to do, I mean, I I don't recommend going to the negative coping mechanisms like the drinking or the drugs or the sex or the pornography or, you know, take all of those out. Other than that, what do try anything. I mean, I, I kind of got to the point where the, the, my counselor or my psychiatrist would offer these things. And I'd be like, you know, I'll try anything at this point. And I, in doing that, I found that I could halfway draw. I had no idea, no idea that I could halfway do that. No one else is going to buy my stuff. I'm not saying I'm that good, but I used it. I used art and I would, I would draw, I call it journal draw. I would draw how I felt, or I would draw an event and kind of portray how I felt at that time when it happened. And it became part of my therapy. Um, I actually wrote a book um, and that those are, became my illustrations for it. Um, that version of the book will never be seen by anybody else, <laughs> but it actually has evolved into a, a more helpful book now that is that I'm working on, but I, I didn't know I could do that. And it was me going, all right, I'll try. Um, if you really don't think that's something for you, I try coloring. Um, they make therapeutic coloring books and you can go online and download free coloring pages for adults or you could do kids who cares no one's judging no one else has to know but just getting the just getting that emotion out and it's surprising how much that can really help you work through things and kind of release um talk therapy obviously um i totally did the meditations the affirmations um yoga um, I, I became just, I loved yoga. I used to hate it. I thought it was not stimulating enough, but it just, it, it helped me get stronger physically, which I believe our mind, body, and spirit all should be in one. So if you're getting better and stronger in one area, the rest are going to kind of come with it, come with you. And, but it helps spiritually and your breathing and it helps with so many, so many different things. Um, I used to run. I can't do that right now anymore because my I hurt my back and that's a whole nother issue. Um, but exercise, just getting things moving. Um, what else? I did, I, I, I did and tried a lot. I love the idea of saying yes, like trying and being very open-minded. I think Chandra Rhymes wrote a book about <gasps> saying yes. Yeah, yes, read it. <laughs> um, <laughs> reading, reading is huge. Um, And one thing I I like to say is our input plus our environment equals our output. So um, when I talk to my mechanic friends, um, I'll say, okay, if you have a regular gas running car, what happens if you put diesel fuel in there? It's still fuel, right? Well, it's not right for the car. The car is not going to work. So it's not going to give you the output you want. Um, Same thing with what we eat. You know, um, here's the nurse and me coming out. I hope it's not too crude, but we poop out what we eat and the environment that we are around. That's what comes out because that's what puts in. So it's so important to really listen to your body um, when you're watching a TV show, when you're reading anything, listening to music, when you're 
trying to figure out what to watch on Netflix or what to listen to on YouTube. Um, what you put in is going to affect you huge. Um, there for a while, I couldn't watch anything other than like dance movies, figure skating movies, um, friends. I watched friends because it made me laugh. Um, what's his name? Mike Hart. No, Kevin Hart, the comedian. I mean, I was very, very aware and I still am. I don't have to be quite as censored, but you have to be very careful what you're putting in, um, what you're listening to and the people that you have in your life. Um, it, it really pays a toll on, on your healing one way or another. Um, so sometimes you have to eliminate or at least limit some people's access to you. And then you got to find those that are going to be your, your warriors and your angels by your side and you keep them a little closer. Beautiful. I love that. So you've taken us from one point in your life of a very dark time to now where, you know, you're drawing, you're finding a creative spirit <laughs> within you. And I think through your story, you are going to inspire people and give them more hope. And so if you were going to leave our listeners with one final thought, what would that be? I think it would be, I mean, other than what I've already said, um, is wherever you are right now, it's okay. Your feelings are never wrong. It's how we respond to those feelings and how we react to those feelings that can be better or, or not. And wherever you are, it's just a matter of leveling up. And that, cause you, it's just impossible to go from the lowest of lows to the highest of highs that quick. I, I just don't see that as possible. What you can do is if I still do this to this day, if I'm having a really bad day and I'm just like, Bleh, am I going to get too ecstatically happy by the end of the day? Probably not unless something, unless I win the lottery or something really huge. Um, and then it won't last, but I can move up. I can pick a book to read. I can pick a movie to watch. I can pick time to sit and pet my dog who is an emotional support animal that isn't licensed or anything, but she's just the sweetest. She's amazing. And just time with her can just lift me up, level up. So with the same thing with recovery and wherever you are in your journey, don't worry about going from red to green. Don't worry about going from bottom to high, just level up and continue to level up. And there's going to be times where you're going to slip back down. It's life. <laughs> um, there's always going to be something that can knock us down. And so you just level up, level up. The good news is um, if you're way down here and you level up a little bit and you slide back down, your body knows, your spirit knows, your soul knows how to get there. And it can get there quicker once you've already done it. So then you just work up those levels again. And it, and you know, at first you think, oh, it took me like 10 months to get myself to that point. Oh my goodness. It's not, that doesn't mean it has to take you 10 more months to get to that point. Again, your body knows you just have to remind it. You just have to support it. And our bodies just have a way of knowing we just need to support our bodies and they heal so well, as long as we back out of the way sometimes and just stop, stop putting all the resistance against it. So just wherever you are in the process, just level up. And even if you're not down at the lowest of lows, if you're just someone who's reaching for something better in life, that's what I like to say is we're just, just double up. I make I it sound, that. I make it sound easy, but it's not necessarily easy, but it's simple. <laughs> right. And it's one step. It's one breath at a time. It's not about making mm -hmm. these major monumental you know, changes where it has to be from one point right. to the drastic other side. It's about accepting mm -hmm. where you're at in that moment, taking accountability for yourself, for your life and doing anything that is part of that self-care regimen to get you that one mm -hmm. step higher on that ladder. So I love that. You have beautiful analogies. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> and Tracy, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us for today's episode. And again, sharing uh, how you, you got, me. yeah, how you got from that one point to where you're at now. I trust that this message will be well received. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it.
For more information on Tracy's work, visit tracylowry.com. Stories like this one are important to tell. It reminds us that even during the darkest times, we can always find light. We can always choose faith over fear. For exclusive content, please join my Spark Plug members only community and apply to be a guest on this show. Find out more at spiritandspark.com.